was spellbound. This is such a fascinating piece of history that here in the United States, we haven't heard this side of things. And I just, I can't thank you enough for making the doc. Well, thank you so much for those very kind words. Uh, it, it was a real honor. How did you even decide to tackle this subject? Did you Were you eating breakfast one day and got this really cool idea? Ooh, they must have spies from Cuba in the United States. Maybe we should find out. Uh, <laughs> this isn't exactly the kind of topic that pops to the forefront. No, it's not. What I would say is, is that I grew up in the 1980s and my dad loved anything to do with espionage, Cold War, John le Carre books, things like this. Um, so one of the things that we absolutely tried to do was make a, uh, a just a really entertaining spy film. That was kind of the, our paramount uh, ambition. Of course, we have to be entirely accurate. Of course, we have to make it with integrity. But it was really to make an entertaining spy film What was our, was our ambition. Well, you definitely succeeded that. And like you, I am a diehard, diehard espionage fan. To see one told with such great objectivity as you and Ollie have done here, but also with showing us the humanity, giving us both sides of the coin, and the detail that we see is just incredible. How do you even, how did you even approach something like this? Because you have so many moving parts, Gary. You've got your Cuban Five, and the fact you got them all to do sit-down interviews blew my mind. You've got U.S. attorneys. You've got Ramsey Clark. You have two of the defense attorneys for the Cuban Five. Then you've got I could tell somewhere in there you had access to trial transcripts. Yes. And then you've even got a wife, a daughter. And then rather than full recreations, you, you find that Cuban TV show that has so many similarities to what actually was unfolding in real life. How do you even begin with all of this? <laughs> I suppose that's the nature of the job, isn't it? I, I, I like, how do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, old, like the old phrase goes. I think that, um, you know, our starting point was that we had access. You know, you know we eventually got access to, to the spies. And I think, you know, I live such a quiet, bland life. You know, it's bad Wi-Fi is about the extent of my, of my challenges. Um, <laughs> so... When you, hear, when you meet these people that have lived just absolutely extraordinary lives, you know, from volunteering to fight apartheid South Africa in their early 20s to coming back to Cuba headhunted due to their talents, um, headhunted, um, training as spies, and then, you know, living a life in, as an undercover spy in, in America. It's like, it's really quite remarkable. So, so we had, that, that was, you know, it's a, it's a film about the Castro spies, you know, this Cuban five. So, so they take up a large amount of the screen time. But naturally enough, there's all the people that, you know, they're the protagonists. There's also all of the antagonists. And one of the thing, a couple of the things that we wanted to do was to, was to sh just kind of illuminate an audience as to who are the kind of the key characters involved. You know, it's, it's a little confusing saying you've got pro-Cubans, anti -Cubans, Castro Cubans, all in these, you know, all in the area around Florida and Cuba. So our ambition was to try and tell it as cleanly as possible. Um, you mentioned the spy series. You know, it's actually spies. All the work they do are in the shadows. You know, it's very hard for a director to put on screen what a spy does. So mm -hmm. we don't have just talking heads all the time. And in one of our interviews with the uh, with one of the spies, he just happened to mention this TV show, which you, which you just referred to. It's called On Silencio, and it's a kind of a Cuban James Bond meets Magnum P.I. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> shot in Bermuda on a Cuban budget. Um, it, it was it was the biggest TV show in Cuba in the 70s. It's, it was kind of on constant loop over there. And like the way James Bond inspired British guys to join the, you know, their, their secret service, this was a bit of an inspiration for the Cubans. You know, the story is about 
an undercover Cuban spy in America. And it allowed us to show, you know, to just show what what they were doing as, as they were just talking about it. And then it gives the, sh- the documentary a very, very specific style. Uh, you know, it doesn't look like other documentaries and it, it gives it a very Cuban style. So, you know, it, it, ha- it added those things for us and it, and it helped with the visual storytelling. I think it works beautifully. Using clips from that show is so much better than if you had had to do full recreations, reenactments. Now, obviously, I think your your FBI raid is is a reenactment, but if you had peppered this whole documentary with reenactments, it wouldn't be as effective it as it is, and it would feel more manipulated. Thank you. I agree with you. I think you know it's a it's a difficult balancing act that documentary makers have to have to kind of straddle. You know, this tightrope they walk, and that they want it to show it to be really high production values. They want it to be really entertaining. But, you know, if you start reconstructing everything, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky, you know, it's tricky. And some, some series like have done it really well and some others haven't. And we were, we had this archive and we wanted to use it because for the reasons that I mentioned, just kind of really this cue and flavor and it kind of, it's quite, it's a little kitschy, you know, the, you know, the clothes they wear and, and the budgets they, that they had, it was, it, it it's, it's not HBO, you know, it's not <laughs> Netflix, um, but it, it just gives it a bit of a personality. So these were the things that that, that we went for. Uh, it's I think sometimes reconstructions can be a bit stale. They can be a bit flat because they're neat, they don't have the budgets of a, of a feature film, and it's also it's it just it stray it can stray into other formats. So I, I was very happy to work, work with this. One of the strong suits that you have. Uh, from the very beginning, is you give us the timeline. You take us all the way back. You bring us for when Havana, when Cuba was uh, the place to be. It was the playground for the rich and famous in the Western Hemisphere. You take us through. You take us through Castro's early days. And that footage, I don't recall seeing any of that footage before. Obviously, the touristy stuff, yes, we've all seen plenty of that but some of the that early footage black and white footage of castro before just before the revolution and when the, his revolution started fascinating to see because i've never seen it but by giving us that timeline you bring us along you're not just dropping something in our lap you're basically putting us in the shoes of spies who do their homework yeah th- thanks a lot we, we you know it's 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 a confusing story if you don't have a bit of context. Mm-hmm. And, what, and, you know, the, the footage, after kind of building up this relationship with Cuba for a couple of years, at the very end of the process, we actually got access to the Cuban Film Institute. And we had full access to their archive, which was very much a busman's holiday for me to spend two months in the archives of Havana. Um, but the footage of Castro and Che Guevara and a few others in the mountains of the Sierra Maestre, you know, it's really quite incredible. And then the color footage that you see Castro and his men coming into Cuba, that's the first time that that's ever appeared on screens anywhere, wow. including, including Cuba. So that was a real honor to get that. And, you know, I just think it looks amazing, you know, to see the, you know, this, there's, there's nothing like being transported back in time with this kind of color footage. So, so, that, so that was a real, that was a real pleasure. Um, to, to do to be able to have that footage that I, I just was blown away by Gary because in the United States we're so used to seeing images of Castro with what was released by the government for so long since the 60s since the Bay of Pigs era and uh, for most people the only images that they've really seen of him were in his dying days uh, when yep. he was ill even though no, he's not ill. He's running the country. No, he's clearly he's ill. But that's the only context that most of the younger generations have. So to see this, it really it's much more impactful. Yeah, th- thanks. You know, it's, it, it was interesting uh, as an anecdote. Um, our assistant editor, who who wasn't really familiar with Cuba. He had only ever seen Fidel in army fatigues screaming at a, at a, at a podium or, mm-hmm. or at a dais, 
Whereas in, as you went through all of the footage, he actually came across an awful lot of Fidel. He, he has much more of a father figure in, in Cuba. And sorry, he's not even called Castro in, in Cuba. He's called Fidel. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, we actually had to, you know, it, we just felt for a Western audience, which is what this is aimed at. You know, it's an American and a European audience is, is our ambition primarily, is that by calling it Fidel, Fidel spies, you know, we all know them as Castro spies. Yeah. So, so, we, so as Castro, sorry, as Castro. So that's that's why we kept the kept that story, the title, excuse me, uh, as as Castro rather than Fidel spies. Yeah, well, I remember when I was growing up, and there were jokes going around about him trying to lighten the whole situation in the sixties and the seventies, and people would joke and call him faithful fetal. <laughs> all of that is just so enlightening. And it shows, it gives us a different perspective. That's one of the great things that you do here. You give the Western audience, particularly the American audience, a different perspective than what the... One of the things, oh, sorry. One one of the things we were trying to do is to show that the spies weren't operating in a vacuum. You know, they were operating and they were reacting to what was happening around them. And I think the most dramatic version of this, the most dramatic element of this was their reaction to the hotel bombings. So the the Cuban economy had been paralyzed after the Soviet Union pulled out or, or collapsed. And they're literally their only source of income was the, um, the tourism industry. So when the tourism industry was attacked and uh, bombs started going off, you know, you're talking about a huge percentage of their GDP was going to be wiped out. So this was actually like an existential threat that was facing Cuba. It wasn't just a couple of, you know, bombs being left off in the ho- in, you know, in, in certain areas. So that's why they had to, I suppose, ramp up their activities in Miami. And mm-hmm. ultimately, that's why they got caught. Mm-hmm. It just blows my mind. At what point did you come up with your through line so that as you're going, spending your two months going through archival footage, you know what you can use and what you can't use? Or was your through line taking shape as you went through that archival footage at the Cuban Film Institute? Yeah, it's like a big lump of granite, you know. <laughs> it starts off very, very large and you chisel, chisel away a little bit at a time. Um, Ali, the director, was also the editor. So, you know, he spent about a year on and off in, in the edit suite. Um, our first cut was substantially longer. It was about three hours. And, you know, bit by bit, we, we pulled it together into this into this format that you see it now, which is just over 100 minutes. It's it's a very big story. You know, it's, it's a story that covers a large amount of time. Um, uh, we, we felt, for the reasons that we discussed earlier, was that we, we felt we had to show context to their actions. So it takes a little bit of time. And one of the other things that we wanted to bring in was the kind of the position of the exile. Uh, mm-hmm. And the exile is, is, plays a big part of, of many societies, but in Cuba, really particularly. You know, you, so essentially you have every middle and upper class person from pre-revolutionary Cuba left. They either left or were thrown out. Or, um, so they have a very... So, so for them, Fidel is the devil. You know, and they have... You know, it's a, it's, you know, I, I think you'd have to have a heart of stone not to feel sorry for them. You know, like they've had, they've lost their homeland. It's, it's a very tragic situation for them. And as a result, this causes them to do more and more extreme things. Um, in, in, Miami, in Miami and Florida, there are many, many organizations that are trying to topple Fidel and now the current Cuban regime. Um, and one of our challenges was is that this is really, really juicy stuff, you know, for a filmmaker. You know, you have lots of these armed bands. They have all of these elaborate names, acronyms. You know, it sounds very much like a John le Carre novel. Mm-hmm. But it just became a little bit unwieldy for us because there's so many of them. So we focused in on, on probably the main one, which is Brothers to the Rescue the, uh, and Jose Basulto. And Jose Basulto has this huge place in... Miami's society and culture, and he had such a big impact um, due to the role of the shootdown and the actions of Brothers to the Rescue. So we felt he was the key organization that we were going to follow. And that's why we, we had these three elements of the story. We had the, the Cuban spies in Miami, we had the Cuban exiles in Miami, and then we had the, the law and police uh, 
bodies from America. So those three, the interactions between the three are, are, are what the story pivots around. Mm-hmm. And I found Basulto just so interesting. So interesting. And that perspective. How challenging was it or difficult was it to get access to each of these gentlemen of the Cuban Five to speak with them? Yeah, one of the things that was that is often asked by us to to us is is, is that very question. And and one of the things that we we can say is that it was actually once we turned on the cameras, it was it was there was no kind of director trick or anything involved to try and get people to talk. Every single person in this story feels they're a hundred percent correct. So you know, the, as you saw, Basulto was very very confessional in his in his oh, interview. Yes, He's like he he like he openly talks about being involved in counterinsurgency like he shot a cannon at a hotel he was a trained trained cia person he was in the bay of pigs like he, he you know he broke international law by flying over cuba so like he, there's no um not one side all sides agree on the facts you know everyone everyone's agreeing on this you know but what the difference of is of opinion is that basulta felt he was justified where mm-hmm. the cubans don't uh, and similarly the, the cuban five the facts are all there in the court transcripts. You know, there's 20,000 words or, or, or sorry, 100,000 words. It's a huge, it's a huge document. So that allowed us to cross-reference what all parties were saying. But, you know, all parties said the same thing. It's just that they disagreed with the, 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 the justification for their actions. Mm-hmm. How did you get access to each of the Cuban Five? Yeah, Ali started this project before I did. So Ali had started researching it and he'd been working on it for about 18 months, maybe even two years. And it's a, Cuba gets approached by a lot of well-meaning left-wing, let's call them, mm-hmm. um, filmmakers. And, you know, we're not that, we're just filmmakers. So it takes a certain amount of while for them to trust you. And, and it takes a certain while of approaches and persistence and stamina. Um, I think the fact that we got support from our national film board here, the Screen, Screen Ireland, that showed that we were, weren't just kind of amateurs or, um, or well-intentioned amateurs. So that start, helped us on the process. And then it was by initially forming a relationship with the Cuban um, embassy in Ireland. And then they put us through into the di- diplomatic circuit, you know, into, into that infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And then just after the project started, the first Cuban spy was released as a result of, sorry, it was just after Obama did the release. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things were happening around us as we were in production. And it was just like, it was just normal stuff that filmmakers do, you know, just dogged determination was, 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 was how we got it. Mm -hmm. So now I've got to ask you then, in your opinion, had this been an American film documentarian, trying to make this do you think that an american filmmaker would have gotten the, the access to the cuban five as you did i think it would have been a lot harder i think that w- i think that's reasonable to say um i think that you know an example that jumps out is that oliver stone did do a documentary on fidel castro mm-hmm. so it's, it's it's by no means impossible and um, there's also a cuban documentary on netflix called cuba and the cameraman so that camp, that director also met Fidel, so you know the Cubans. I think would have met an American filmmaker. I just think the fact that I'm, I'm Irish, Ali's based in Ireland. It's it's. I think it's potentially easier. That was my first take uh, after watching the documentary. Is I did not think that an American filmmaker would have had the success with access that you had. Or if they did, it would have been very protracted and very strained. Yeah, potentially, yeah. I, I think as well, it's just that, you know, I think the Cubans would be slightly more, I'm, I'm, this is conjecture, but I, you know, because we're all a product of our environment. And I'm sure that the Cubans would have been slightly wary of an American filmmaker who, who they approached because, you know, there would have been many that would have done as they perceive it to be anti-Cuban. So I think the process would have taken longer. But my, my feeling is that, a, a determined American filmmaker would have would have got access after a while. Mm-hmm. Something that really struck me is the passion that Guy Lewis still has. <laughs> oh my lord, he just cannot he cannot let go. 
He cannot let go. I've known attorneys like that, prosecutors like that, but boy, he is still fire and brimstone about the Cuban Five. I get the impression that he was very anxious to talk about this. I have to confess, I, I had a real fondness for Guy when I met him. He, he, um, he couldn't have been any more helpful to me. Like he was just, you know, he gave me an awful lot of time. He gave me the option to come back to him. He's been very receptive on any communication that I've done. He's, in, he's given me uh, information that's been really inf- helpful in our other, you know, people to meet and things like that. So he couldn't be, he couldn't have been any more helpful. He, I also think he's fantastic on camera. I think he really, oh. as, a, as, a, as a filmmaker, he really is just, his delivery is fantastic. His passion is very, very obvious. And it's something that he still clearly feels very <laughs> passionately about. But, you know, I think he could also very, very, very much say the same about the others. You know, mm-hmm. what did the Cuban Five say, you know, after, after spending, you know, 15 years in prison? Yeah. Like, you know, if I had to do it all again, I'd do it. Jose Basulto is in his 80s and he's still <laughs> trying to topple the Castro or the Cuban regime. This is a very, this is a very emotive subject. This is really a subject that really is, people have high passions about. And you can still see it on the streets of Miami. You know, it's still the story for them. Mm -hmm. I was surprised that you were able to get, and I loved what Paul McKenna and Jack Blumenfeld as defense attorneys for some of the Cuban Five. It was very interesting to get their perspective as well. I was so happy that you were able to include them. Yeah, they they had a very interesting, and just that you mentioned it, I've got the very sad news to to read yesterday that that Jack Blumenfeld passed away, which was very sad to hear because he was again couldn't have been a nicer person but w- what i would say is is that the these 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 gentlemen these lawyers grew up in florida on the on the main and they would have been in that environment where cuban spies would have been seen to have been you know the baddies let's let's for simplistic way say it that way but they were really convinced of the integrity of their clients and it really had a kind of a a very much a, a, an eye-opening experience for them and it's also from a professional level this is the biggest case they ever covered in their lives sure. you know it's, it's the longest case in espionage in american history still or it certainly was when we when we made it so this was you know their most interesting their most exciting case that they ever covered so they were really happy to talk to us about it, and, and they learned, you know, they got to fly to America to Cuban air bases. You know, this is this is exciting <laughs> stuff. You know, it's it's the stuff that boys dream of, and um, they had some real, really great insights for us about how the different elements of it works, uh, because a big part of the final prosecution is this is the analysis of whether they had a fair trial or not. So so we had the different sides giving their opinions on that. And we kind of let their audience bring, make their own judgment on that. That's something that I found really, really interesting as part of the appellate process yeah. here. Those cases never should have been heard there. There should have been a change of venue. You would think so. You know, I think, you know, as someone with no skin in the game, I think, yes, you know, I think that that would be a reasonable position. Uh, and, but, you know, as someone who's so familiar with the law, as yourself, you know, it's it's quite interesting just to hear who sits on juries. You know, there's only so much we can go into in, yeah. in a documentary, but, you know, the actual people that were listening to the, to the case, you know, it's a very specific demographic of, of people. So to have that in Miami made it difficult. Um, there's, a, there's a journey that they go on, uh, and Paul McKenna probably best sums it up as he, you know, he was up when he was down and, and all of these type of things. But the... You know, the Cubans never lost their faith that they were going to be released. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's genuinely, it's quite. Re- I find it quite remarkable that they were able to keep that faith, you know, the whole time. Mm-hmm. One of the great things, and it's too bad that their business has turned so bad, but Radio Shack would have been a great company to, <laughs> it, to sponsor this film. <laughs> it made the financing of it an awful lot easier. Because one of the, the, the things that I think people don't realize is that anytime you have an espionage situation, there's always backup support. There are agencies behind it. This is something we see very clearly and we hear from the Cuban Five. They had no backup. It was each of them on their own 
going to Radio Shack and getting <laughs> listening devices and record and tape recorders and this is it. Nobody was going to come in to help them. This was not James Bond having M or anybody else. <laughs> they didn't have fancy gadgets. They didn't even have you know a Get Smart shoe phone. You couldn't be more. You couldn't be more true. You know, I think they had. It, uh, they've never told me how many people were in their what's called the Wasp network. You know, but it would it was a number of dozen. You know, and they had a budget of something like thirty two thousand dollars per annum, not not per person for the for the entire. Network. Oh my gosh! So you know, this is this is pocket change for for someone. You know, that's that would be the you know the fuel bill for for an equivalent. So they were very tenacious, and, and even Basulto and Guy Lewis would accept this that they were very highly trained and very tenacious. So what they lacked in in finances, they had to make up and and skill and you know and, and, and flexibility and just tenacity. And I suppose one of the things from a filmmaker's perspective that was quite nice for us to do is this was the very last part of the analog area. You know, mm-hmm. this was a time of tapes, dial-up modems, uh, pay phones. Um, it, it, it was pre-digital. Like nowadays, this would all be just done on people's mobile phones and texts and all these type of things. But it was, you know, it was CB radios. So, you know, we got to go down this kind of geeky wardrobe rabbit hole you know so we bought the same equipment that they had we bought the same uh, dictaphones that they used uh, and and that allowed us to kind of recreate their spy layers but layers is kind of saying it is somewhat melodramatically like these were very ramshackle apartments in miami you know they they drove you know rubbish cars you know they had to have double jobs you know as as jack blumenthal said antonio made more money as a as a janitor than he did as a spy <laughs> so it was you know it was very much the opposite of james bond you know tuxedos glamorous women in the casino it, it wasn't that life it was real kind of you know it, it was real kind of uh, real passionate hard edged you know underground Put it dogged, you know, that, that's, I think, a good way of saying it. Was it difficult for you and Ollie to stay on point with what you wanted to say with this documentary once you got into everything, talked to all the men, went through all this footage, read the transcript? Because I see so many different branches that you could have added and just gone down the rabbit hole. This is the this is the big challenge of an edit. You know, you start off with a plan and a treatment, and I'd certainly be lying to you if I said our treatment was the same as how it finished in the edit. You know, some things have to work a little bit better than you think, uh, and vice versa. And um, it's a big subject, and there's a lot of strands to it. But there was, you know, there's one of the things that I, I thought was problematic about the the, the narrative version, the called the Wasp Network was this kind of jumping around between all the different narratives so Mm -hmm. we we tried to keep it as clean and as linear as people could uh, you know within reason so so the audience could follow us for the reasons that you know there is quite a large cast of characters there are people that are all cuban that are you know pro castro in florida anti castro in florida and, and and so on so that was a real challenge for us to make it understandable i found it to be extremely understandable But now having seen it, there are aspects that I now want to go when I have time and just do a little more research on myself just because it's it's interesting. Yeah. I could even see other aspects of this being turned into documentaries or even a a mini-series. Yeah, certainly that would be an ambition of ours. You know, there's so much scope. You know, as as I mentioned, there's, you know, there's probably a dozen, maybe 15 of these organized anti- Cuban government organizations in Florida, all the different things that they did were very fascinating. And um, there's so many other stories. There's, there's a number of other characters that we had to chop out. There was, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of material there. So if, if in the future we got that opportunity, it's something we'd love to do because yeah. there's no shortage of material. And something that you very keenly do here, you don't politicize this. Yeah, you know, I don't think we needed to. You know, we... we I'm not coming at this as a pro or anti Castro Cuban, you know, or American. It's uh, I wanted to make a really entertaining spy film. I wanted to have a film that people got the babysitter in and went out on Saturday night and would go and see this in the cinema, or they'd you know get a bottle of wine and watch it at home on a, on a nice flat screen. This was this was this was the ambition. I think if you make kind of uh, 
if you make films for it, it, it just it speaks to the you know you're, you're preaching to the choir and they're they're kind of dull so that we, I had no interest in doing that because you've got score in here and I love the score that you have it's, Thank you. it's very subtle but it's it is almost like a connective thread between everything so I'm curious about your work with Damien Lynch your composer and your thoughts working with him in what you were looking for musically to tie this all together. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was a real pleasure to, to work with Damien, or, or Damo as we call him. Um, this, this was his first film score that he commissioned, and he really went headlong into it. Um, we are always trying to get a score that is both moves the story up and down as you want it to, but you also want it to have this uniformed, consistent feel to it. And I think he did that really, really well. I think the there's, there's certain moments that he really ups the, the tempo, and that's suitable, without being melodramatic at any points. There's also points of poignancy, which I think he brings in very nicely as well. But I think what he does best is that a lot of the time you don't know it's there. And I think that's that was one of the things that I loved. Yeah, it's very subtle, and it's almost... It works almost like some of the old images from the 1950s, the, that great, the coastal images of the calm sea just kind of undulating. Uh, uh, what what Damon is as well, he's, he's, uh, he's, an, he's a self-confessed geek about this type of stuff. <laughs> so he bought loads of 1980s and 90s era equipment, musical equipment. So it's all original recordings that he's made rather than digital samples that he's taken. So like the like the spies and the lair, Demo went went back to the nineties and made an analog uh, score for us. And that's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Before I let you go, Gary, I'm really curious. What is it about documentaries, making documentaries, that speaks to you? I think what documentaries do amazingly well, um, if they're good, is that they take you from a world that you may or may not know anything about and transports you to that world. And it's a world that you find fascinating, uh, entertaining, and it gives you a little bit of escape from, from your world. So that's what I think documentaries do if they're done well, really well. And do you have anything else coming up after Castro Spies that you're working on? Yes, just, just, just released today, actually, in, in Cannes, is, um, in the marketplace there, is a film I did called Piano Dreams, which is quite a change of gear from Cuban Spies. This is on Chinese piano prodigies. <laughs> And their mothers, so it is. You know, it's 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 a very different uh, change of pace, but it's one uh, I really, really, really enjoyed. Um, it tells the stories of three Chinese piano prodigies uh, of different ages as they're trying to move up, as they're trying to get into the different conservatories, and as as another one is trying to get into college in America. So it, it also tells the stories of the incredible sacrifices that their families make. Their mothers leave their hometowns to join them in, in Shanghai as part of the schools. And it just shows it's a little snapshot into the world of China's up and coming middle class. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what you're saying, once again, you're tapping into the human element, just as you did with Castro's spies. Yeah, that's that's certainly the ambition. You know, we got amazing access from the families. They couldn't have been nicer to us. They, they no request of which there were many was too was too big for them. Uh, so they were, you know, they're really wonderful, and, and the production team has become fast friends with them. And um, they're also, you know, China is so much more intense than 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 the West. You know, there's so many more people. The competition is much higher, and you know, you've got one child, you've got two parents, and four grandparents. You know, drilling down this familial pressure and expectations and hopes. So you know, it, it's it's very different from from the from the world I grew up in, and it's. It's fascinating to me. Wow. Well, I can't wait to see that one. So that just that just premiered today at Cannes. That that is it's in the marketplace in Cannes, yes, and it's going to be on a film festival release um, from the summer on. I will definitely be on the lookout for it in the fest circuit here in the states. My gosh. Fingers crossed, we get into many more. Well, hope so, Gary. This has been so enlightening. And so much fun talking to you about Castro's Spies. I mean, these are the kind of, of documentaries I love. These I love espionage films. So I was just a little pig in heaven watching this one. <laughs>
and I want to see more. But as I said, I'm going to have to go dig into some of this myself now because it is so interesting and it's something that the American people are never really privy to. Yeah, again, you know, as, as a neutral in this, you know, one of the things that is quite baffling is the, the embargo. You know, mm. it's, it's, I think that the, you know, speaking just very matter of factly, there are many countries in the world that have, that are much more hostile towards America and, you know, have been at war with America and various other variants of that. So it's, 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 it's very surprising why the embargo is still in place. Now, the reasons for that are the, the Cuban exile community have such an important um, controlling influence in politics of Florida. And what we've all seen in recent presidential elections, why, how important Florida is. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that, that's what I've learned over the course of this production. And um, I think that's interesting. I think most Americans north of Florida wouldn't really have a strong opinion either way on the embargo. Um, so I, maybe that will give pause for thought as, as part of this film. Mm. It's, it's unlike anywhere in the world. I can say that. I'm not sure if you've had the chance to go. No, uh, I would love to. You know, <laughs> it is like going back into, you know, the, the era of Joe DiMaggio. And, <laughs> this, you know, when you see the, the Chevys and the cars from the 50s, you know, there's nowhere else like that. Um, and you've got, you know, you've got buildings that are kind of falling down and they've amazing texture. And, you know, it's, it's, it's. I can say that I can say with certainty that there's nowhere else like it in the world. Imagine their life, you know. You imagine the life that they had, and then they go from that to Florida, and they're scrubbing pans. You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's it's. There's no way that they aren't really hostile to, towards Castro. So we we try and bring that in into the film. And you do it well. There's something for it gives pause for people to think that there are always two sides two sides of the coin, and then the edge around the, around the middle. Gary, thank you so, so much. I hope we get to do this again. Yes, absolutely. It was a real pleasure talking to you. I'm kind of, if you need anything else um, or any other questions, feel free to email me or call. Gary, this was a fabulous way to start my day. I can't thank you enough. And I look forward to the next time. Thanks so much. A real pleasure. Bye Thanks, bye, Gary. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.